Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to The Niche Cast on a Thursday after a uh, traumatic 48 hours of Aotearoa sport. We are here to debrief it all, and obviously all whites lost, black caps lost, lots of other funky Aotearoa sporting stuff happening, but um, those things will definitely have to process some emotions there, wildcard, and we're going to chat through it. For this episode of the niche cast if you do want to listen to all our aotearoa cricketing takes fall down the dunny big up to the patreon podcast every week we do a specific cricketing podcast for the patreon whanau which also just doubles with any other funky aotearoa sporting topics that we want to discuss on a tuesday morning big up to the patreon whanau patreon.com forward slash our niche cache all these links are in the description box that's the best way to support the niche cache and the niche cast all our content which is pretty much everywhere we're just coming at you from all angles as we tend to do and patreon's the best way to support us straight up the guts you support us and there's always an extra podcast every week there as well so big it up to all the members of the patreon Fano, and uh big it up to anyone else who wants to support the niche cache and our podcast our email banger and all our good stuff in that way as well Speaking of the email banger, every Monday and Friday we dispatch our random Aotearoa sporting thoughts, just extra bits and bobs every Monday and Friday evening, as well as all the regular niche cache content, the links to the podcast, the links to all the big yarn, yarns on our website, as well as extra yarns written just for the email bangers on a Monday and Friday evening. Sign up to that, the nichecache.substack.com, sign up. Into your email address, bang, niche case straight to you on a Monday and Friday evening. How fucking good. And of course, we're from the niche case, which is a big old website featuring major Aotearoa sporting yarns, the niche case.com. Uh, I've done a fresh breakdown of the Aotearoa Kiwis squad, which is pretty funky. The wild card is far better at dealing with his emotions after defeats. So he did an immediate reaction to the always loss to Costa Rica. And at some point, I'll process my emotions with the Black Caps and we will uh, start writing about the Black Caps as well. But all the big yarns are on the website. I'm thinking of doing a big old uh, Kiwi County Tour update. All the lads on the County Tour scored some runs, took some wickets. So I might debrief that tomorrow. A uh, bunch of Kiwi NRL spotlights. The wild card has got his flying Kiwis. He's got his uh, all white stuff. It's all there for you. The niche dash cache.com. That's what we do every day. That's our hustle. That's our grind. And we show up and we bang out podcasts as well. And we always start our podcast wild card with a dose of mindfulness. I needed it on Tuesday and I definitely need some more. So what do you got? Yeah, <laughs> I think I need a bit myself as well. Um, uh, this is, where are we? Mr. Ram Das, of course, who says, we can't push the world away. We have to enter fully into life in order to become free. So that basically me translates to like, you have to embrace the niggle. You can't yeah. pull away from it because that's life. Life is the light and the dark and the good and the niggly. And you got to get into that niggle. You got to get into that mess, get into the mangroves, get lost in the mangroves to really feel life, right? Yeah, feel all the feelings and experience all the experience kind of things. Because um, otherwise, like, why are we here? You know, <laughs> what, 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 what are we trying to achieve um, if we're not going to actually like do the thing? Like <laughs> you, you call it life, so do the do the living part of it. You know, it, made, it, it makes up. It makes sense when you think about it from that sort of abstract term. We live and you learn, and losses are where the learning comes from. Shows your mindset. We're always trying to grow, <laughs> yep. and I think the anytime that something pisses you off, this is like a this is basically the segue between mindfulness and Aotearoa sporting chat. Anytime you like something pisses you off, it's telling you something, and there's wis there's wisdom mm. to be gained in being pissed off and what is frustrating you, what's annoying you, and you, if you look into that through whatever your mindfulness practice, whatever however you do it you'll find the root of your problem. And I was like, well, I'm pissed off. I, like, I'm pissed off with England. I'm pissed off with the black caps. Like, it's annoying me. It's frustrating me. It's making me angry. Like waking up in the morning, 
catching up on the last few hours and all that stuff and it just like sets my day off bad because it's the first thing i check and it's pissing me off and it's making me angry and you know why is that the case and it's literally just because i was wrong (laughs) i had ideas of how this series would go none of those ideas came to be in any way shape or form it's actually working out the complete opposite not just from being down 2-0 but everything's gone wrong rampant covid injuries like shit's just hit the fan and that doesn't piss me off what pisses me off was my ego being wrong so i've just been working through that and just trying to come out the other side and like it still pains me when I open Crick Info to check in the county scorecard, see how Ratchin Revenge against Glenn Phillips, you know, Jacob Duffy's taking William wickets, Will Williams has taken wickets from Canterbury as well with Lancashire. But first I have to go to Crick Info and see the headlines about how good Bat Brennan McCullum is, the Baz effect, the Red Bull Revolution, England cricket is fucking fantastic and all that stuff. And you know. A day ago, it was pissing me off. And then you, know, you get deep into the mangroves with the mindfulness, and you're like, well, I was just wrong. And it's okay to be wrong. And you keep learning, you keep growing, and we just uh, respect to England. How about that? Respect to England. Big up Brendan McCullum. Great coaching, good cricket. And uh, I think that is a segue into Black Caps Cricket Wildcard. Although you may be able to then also apply some mindfulness to what happens with what happened with the All Whites as well. So I'm not sure which direction you want to take this down, but hi to Mike. Well, let's do Black Caps first, since you've kind of laid the platform there. Because um, it feels to me like this, yeah, it's, this is more some of that big picture context, um, keeping it all nice and mindful kind of um, thinking here. But like the timing of this tour we thought was really good. Like we thought this was the Black Caps going over at a time when they're in a good place and um, England cricket is not in a good place. And those two things will align lovely into a nice, um, you know, two or three nil series victory and a bunch of world test championship points back on the, back on the horse and that kind of, um, in that race as well. It's kind of happened the opposite of that. And it seems like maybe the, um, just thinking about it a little bit more, it's like the Black Caps actually weren't great over the summer. Like they've, they've been great over the last three or four years in Test cricket. They weren't good in the summer. They they missed some key players, blah, blah, blah. Like we know there were reasons why they lost a, lost the Test to Bangladesh, lost the Test to South Africa. Um, there are uh, mitigating factors, as they say, you know, like Kane Williamson didn't play any of those Test matches. Um, I think Trent Bolt missed a couple and, you know, just various like, testings of the depth and that's always going to be difficult that actually hasn't changed in england like that the, if those were mitigating factors for home test matches where we know test cricket has a huge home versus away disparity the hardest thing to do is to go win series against good teams away from home which is what the black cats were trying to do they actually haven't really been in a better position than they were over the summer like williamson's missed a test henry nichols missed a test um and they've not been thrashed in, in e- either of these. It, the, the way it's ended has felt like absolutely brutal, but that's because four days through the test match, four days through each of these test matches, despite the big swings up and down, the Black Cats were still in a position where they, could, where they were pushing for a victory. Um, they were still in a position where they probably shouldn't have lost it going into the final session of the last um, test, although... I don't know. I just, uh, I didn't have time to watch the highlights before the all whites were on. And then after that, I just was focused on that. I just, I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to bring myself to watch Johnny Besto smashing sixes off Bolton Sally. I just, I don't think I'll ever watch those um, highlights. So I'm just going to, it's this, this is scoreboard, um, scoreboard uh, intimations rather than anything else. But they had to score like 160 runs in that session and they did it. And that's an incredible feat that doesn't happen hardly ever in test cricket. And then the, you know, the massive run chase that they got in the first test on the back of a, just an absolutely brilliant, almost flawless Joe Root century. Like, what do you, what do you do against that? But both those times bowling for a, like bowling for a test victory down a bowler or two. Kyle Jamison wasn't able to bowl in the in the last set. Like, that's another one of those injuries picking on the team. And here, unlike in the home summer, you get injuries during the test match 
even worse because you're down a Kai. Like you can't even replace them at that point unless they can cast, which happened with Jack Leach in the first test. But happened with Jack Leach half an hour into the first test, which is strange. Um, but yeah, like a, another example of just weird, weird things happening across this thing. Uh, like De Gronholm was injured and couldn't bowl in the um, in the in the first test in the fourth innings, well, Joe Root scored the unbeaten man of the match kind of century. Who got Joe Root out in the first innings? It was Colin de Gronholm. He couldn't bowl in that one. AJ Patel wasn't allowed to bowl. He was, I mean, part of that's just because we didn't set a big enough total to be able to get the spinner out there um, and risk them attacking him. But, you know, that that's effectively down a bowler as well. It's, the, the understrength thing is going to kill you in test cricket. We learned this over the summer and then we've just seen more of it on this England tour. And then the flip side of it is that we thought England were at rock bottom, but when you think about it, I mean, rock bottom was the ashes. They're at the thing after the rock bottom, which is the reset of the cycle, which is when everyone gets enthusiastic and whatever, like the honeymoon, the honeymoon period. Exactly. Which is why I'm also not going to overreact to Crick Info, Baz Effect, Red Bull Revolution stuff, because like this is obviously this is when that's going to be felt when you like taking on an understrict New Zealand team and then just coming up with miracle fourth innings chases in order to win. Like, it's not like you, they, they bowled us out for 130 on the first day of the, of, on the first session of the, um, well, first two sessions of the first test. Didn't exactly run away with the test from that point. It's not like they've been absolutely dominant over five days of these ones. They've just had these brilliant fourth innings. And with like, is this going to continue? Are they going to be able to do that every single time? I mean, it's it's some nice alignment for them in this case, and it's been uh, pretty rubbish timing for the Black Cats. But what happens when they? I think they go to they go to Pakistan um, later in the year. I think is their next tour. What happens there? Are they going to be able to do the exact same thing away from home? Like we know that they have lovely batting pitches in Pakistan, but I suspect that might not be quite the same case against England as it was against Australia. Um, and how are you going to fare against like Shane Sharafridi on a, on a dust bowl if he's getting it to move around in the air kind of thing like the different different scenario and we've caught England at the upswing unfortunately like it's 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 a rough time but the upswing like the same cycle has has taken place with English cricket for a long time like the the upswing is followed by the downswing the you know the wheel keeps turning um, unfortunately bad timing for the Black Cats but also I just don't think you can overreact to this series from an English point of view. Like it's a, it's great, but sustain it first. Like the, not just the first instance doesn't mean that everything is fixed. Like keep doing this. Cause we, we've had the Baz effect firsthand and we know that you win some and you lose some in those kind of scenarios. If you want to gamble with going for victories, sometimes you're going to lose tests that you otherwise shouldn't have. Like that's how that goes. I think England are on board with that, but they haven't had to experience the losing part of that yet. And we'll see, we'll see what that looks like over, you know, over given, given 12 months and see how that goes. Cause you can't really judge a coach or a new re or a captain or a new regime or anything like that off of the first series, you know, definitely had those thoughts. Uh, but I tried to push them aside just to be nice to England. You know, I don't want, don't want to be yeah. the, you I mean, know, they the, play the, great. Like well, play. just the, just the whole thing of like, yeah. You, um, I'm a Kiwi and the Black Caps got smoked or have been smoked 2 no in the test. No, as you said, they've had their moments, blah, 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 all that cool stuff, the, the nuance and all that. But generally speaking, they've been smoked in a test series. So then I'm also going to say, yeah, but what are you going to do in six months? What are you going to do in a year? Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> that's part of my mindfulness process that I've been on because I definitely had those thoughts in the dark. Yeah, that's like the, the Costa Rica darkness. series. Um it's serious. The Costa Rica game with the All Whites is like being, yeah. Well, what are you going to do when you come up against Germany, Spain, and Japan in the World Cup? Yeah, good luck. Like, yeah, but that's a bit of a sore loser. He take, isn't yeah, it? You exactly. Know? And that's what we're trying to work through. Um, so yeah. yeah, respect England, but also everything you laid out there was just basically everything's going right for England at the moment, and everything is going wrong for the Black Caps. And when we think about how the Black Caps won the World Test Championship last year, yeah, everything was going right. They literally, um, well, they enjoyed good results and everything was going along. Players were in form and all that shit. And then things happened to also propel the Black Caps into the finals. So it's uh, if we are due for some rotten luck, 
uh, definitely is the case by the looks of it. And that stems back to the home summer. You know, things went against the Black Caps. No Cam Williamson. And as we said over the summer, that first test in Tauranga was specifically designed for a Bangladesh win. And that's what happened. And then some things happened. Um, you know, another no Cam Williamson against South Africa. Yeah, there's some poor signs. And there's like, because a lot of the Aotearoa coverage from the summer was doom and gloom based on those results like is this the black caps of old like now they're just losing so well yeah well the best battle wasn't playing and all these other factors and the depth was tested and all that stuff and i you can look at the results and feel a compounding of it all where it's like okay, well people were sketchy about the results over the summer and now they've just gone to england and lost two tests so obviously things are going to get worse however the bad luck has gotten worse yeah and anytime we're dealing with aotearoa sport if you're moving away from your first 11 or your first 13 or your first 15 or whatever it is our expectations have to change but yeah we can highlight well, this is a good uh, example because if we're dealing with the Black Caps pool of depth, which we have celebrated, the more you dig into that pool, the more expectations have to change. And it's great that we've got this pool of depth and the players available, but they're not first 11 cricketers. Like the Black Caps are a world class cricket side with their first 11 on the park. And then if you take one player out, expectations dip slightly. If you take two players out, expectations dip slightly again. And right now, the Black Caps are like, who knows how this test, how this team for the third test will look. Like, it's basically rando central, really. Like, Cameron Fletcher's got COVID now. So then Dane Cleaver's coming into the equation. Blair Tickner's flying over. And it's just like, it's a bit of a mess. And it kind of feels like the Warriors where you're just like, can we make it through? <laughs> can we just can we just get through to the other side? Because right now this is uh, basically shit hitting the fan. You got injuries, you got COVID, players are out of form. Like we know, um, shout out Matt, Matt Lumpy, I think on Patreon, he was asking about Tom Latham um, and his batting. And you highlighted on the Variety Show that it's almost as simple as Tom Latham as captain doesn't score runs. Yeah. So it's like, okay, Kane Williamson's not playing because he's out. Okay, well, that's Aotearoa's best batter, but it's also, it has a clear impact on Tom Latham's batting. So it's just all these things are just compounding on top of each other for a very frustrating period for Kiwi cricket, I believe. Um, and there's also, I'm liking this background stuff in England as well with the county championship and the T20 Blast because some key ideas about Kiwi cricket are also on display. Like, Will Williams is a first-class seamer. I don't think he's ever going to play international cricket. All respect due to Will Williams. Like, he, he dominates the Plunkett Shield. He just doesn't necessarily have, like, an international cricket profile as far as, yeah. far as like, um, you know, size and stature and speed and all that stuff. But he is very skillful and does a fantastic job. He's just taken wickets in England. So he's just literally taken what he did for the Plunkett Shield into England County Cricket, and he's playing Division 1, and he took, I think, six wickets in a game. Jacob Duffy was horrible in the Plunkett Shield, you know, by, you know, relatively last summer. And I think he took seven or eight wickets in the game for Kent. And he's not even like a first 11 Black Caps test seamer. But he's over there dominating in England as well for his, like, these dudes are kind of just playing one game, uh, let alone whatever Glenn Phillips is doing, because Glenn Phillips loves beating up Poms, so that's fantastic. Also bowling. Um, took a wicket I think he as got well. a hundred and a fifty, didn't he? Um, plus he got a wicket, yeah, in the, in the yeah. second innings for them. So, so all that stuff's happening. All right. So like the same idea from last year is still there, where Aotearoa is the better cricketing nation than England. Last year was because Aotearoa was beating England and had been beating England for a long time, as well as dudes dominating county cricket, dudes dominating T20 Blast. Right now, England are winning the tests. There's also dudes playing really good cricket in county championship cricket and having an impact there. Although, as I say it, like, 
these dudes are playing because everyone else is unavailable. So like you take it with a grain of salt, but that actually brings me to one idea here, Wildcard, where I just wanted to lay out some of the Aotearoa sporting landscape because I was thinking back to this time last year and like we're literally a year on and everything's changed for the Black Caps, right? The whole vibe. Not necessarily like they suck, but everything's against them now. Whereas 12 months ago, everything was for them. And if you look at like, All Whites is not quite a good example because they had just been building, building up, building up, building up, building up, positive, fantastic. And then same time as that the Black Caps are struggling, the All Whites just have a frustrating loss in the most important game. I have got my Matariki timing a bit off over the past week or so, which just to me tells me of the strength of the energy of Matariki, right? Like it's uh, it pulls out multiple weeks and you can feel it coming. Also just, you know, got my dates yeah. wrong. Um, the ripples. Yeah, the ripple effect. Um, the shadow, the Matariki shadow. But then you also look at like the Black Ferns, like, Last year, the Black Ferns were in all sorts of nightmarish situations. Right now, the Black Ferns are winning games. Wayne Smith's the coach. Everything's honkadori. This time last year, Roger Toy Vasashek was leaving the Aotearoa Warriors mid-season. Now, he's in an all-black squad. And you can say the flip side for Sean Johnson. Sean Johnson was trucking along with Cronulla Sharks. Now, he's not in an Aotearoa Kiwi squad. So I think whether it's the Matariki and the the new year type of energy and just the, because I think, you know, the the calendar, we like to think that the new year is December 30th, December 31st, whatever it is. Whereas I think what we're learning now through Matariki is that our calendar and our new year cycle might look more like July to July. Because I'm seeing the changes in Aotearoa sport match with, the Matariki New Year cycle with some of those examples that we just listed there. And I'm curious as a segue into the All Whites, unless you've got more cricket you want to discuss, but it does feel weird where just some of the teams that were really good recently and now not so good and some of the teams that were not so good have now improved and maybe there's mindfulness in that and just like not to judge these teams on, you know, a few weeks ago or a few months ago and just deal with what they're up to now. But that was a bit of a waffle ranting stuff there. So I'm curious where, what tickled your toes and where you want to pick up. Well, there's always, I guess, mindfulness to be had and just like the ups and the downs, you know, of, of sports. Like you, the results are never going to be just win, 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 win in perpetuity. It's one of those things where it's like, you're going to have periods where you have a couple injuries and it gets a whole lot harder or you're going to lose some games you should have won. Like there's always um, the roller coaster effect in, in any sport. Um, the I, I, I hadn't thought about the new year thing like in, in quite the way that you said that. But I guess when you think about it, like the new year is just based, like a, a year itself is just based around the earth spinning around the, the sun once, isn't it? And then you split that into like the lunar cycles, the 12 months, which is how you sort of segment that year. I don't know that there's really anything to say that like this particular um, month is the first month or like, I think that's kind of just one of those things where you draw, you pick a, any spot on a circle and you can say that's the start. Like that's, that's zero slash 360 degrees. So it, that is an interesting way to think about it because when you think like the, the Kiwi sporting year, as well, especially cricket, like cricket peaks sort of across the summer and then the mid year is like the um, the away tours and stuff like that. So it is an interesting one to think about it in that way and like how you get football seasons in, in Europe where it's like the 2021 20, 22 season because it crosses over two years. So sort of. um, that's just that's this probably irrelevant to the podcast, but that just got me thinking because it's one of those things where it's like when you're talking about uh, I don't know Sapreet Singh's form over the last year, and then it actually is over two calendar years because the season crosses over. It's um, if you went by the Matariki calendar, or the, it's suddenly not that's not a problem anymore. You're just calling it the 2023 season or whatever. I don't know. Um, 
the one thing with the black caps and having a lot of dudes over there playing county stuff right now and a few others flying over um is there is also context for that in that they they do have a bunch of limited over stuff coming up afterwards. And they've said basically they don't want anyone who was there from the start of the test sort of be there at the end of the limited over stuff. Like that's a long time away from home um, and they're going to mix it up a little bit. So I'm guessing guys like Cleaver, Tickner, um, or Tickner was over there already. And then he's, um, I don't know if he stayed over, if he came back and was going back again, I guess. I would imagine he was always going to to play some ODIs or 2020s and Cleaver probably we saw him in the last um he's been listed in some uh limited over form squads over the summer so I'm guessing he was going over anyway as well just go over a little bit early um some of these other guys like Glenn Phillips will be hooking up with the lads once they get into white ball stuff and potentially Ruchi Ravindra with his um with his county cricket tour average of 263 i think it is it's, it's a cheeky that, that he's i'm assuming he's not going to play another game because he was only signed on for one game and i saw durham doing like a fairly well kind of um tweet thing this morning so presumably he's going to have the leading average of the entire season because i don't imagine anyone else is going <laughs> to only play one game and score more than 263 ones for the loss of one wicket it's not really counting for anything when you only played one game, but also he scored all those runs and that is his average in county cricket. So shout out to Rachim Ravindra. That was, that's beautiful areas. Trivia. From Trivia question. Yeah. Just from the first innings of the, that game. So Durham versus Worcestershire. So Durham bats, Worcester, we'll say Worcester. Um, they bat. Worcestershire. Yeah, we'll say Worcester. Like the sauce. Just, yeah, we'll say Worcester just for a giggle. Um, so they bat. They each bat once. How many centuries were scored? Um, Ravindra's double hundy counts as one century. Yeah, he was the only double hundred, I think. Um, I don't know what happened in the second innings, but um, there were at least three, I think maybe four in Durham's one. So I'll, I'll say six. Five. Oh, there we go. Five centuries. So Rajan Ravindra was one of five centurions in two innings of batting. I'm so, guessing that was a draw. Yeah, and he also, yeah, because he was not out at the end of the game. Um, yeah. He they was bowled too. 30 overs for 104 and no wickets, so they were having a jolly old time. Um, yeah, sorry for interrupting, but just to maybe bring some focus to the cricket talk, we do have some positives. Daryl Mitchell scored the most runs. Trent Bolt took the yep. most wickets. So I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on those two lads? Like, I mean, we can easily, I think we have talked quite a bit about Daryl Mitchell over the past few podcasts and um, his rise. The Bolty stuff is really good as well because he's taken wickets. He's got 12 wickets and next best is Kyle Jamison's six wickets. So, I mean, we can also overlook the continued excellence of Trent Bolt, which should never be overlooked in the same way that like Tim Southey's uh, sustained excellence can't be overlooked. So yeah, just a couple of words on Daryl Mitchell and Trent Bolt, massive positives before we get into the all whites. Yeah. Tim Southey's sustained excellence with the exception of this test where he took like one for 210 or something and went for nearly six and over or something ridiculous that that'll be the worst test he ever like the worst test figures he ever has in his career so that's one of those like that that's the england at the ashes kind of thing so hopefully the third test is um his england versus new zealand under brendan mccullum um resurgence um trent bolt with ball and trent bolt with bat because he's now the all-time leading run scorer in the number 11 position. Um, drew level with Mattia Murray-Litherin after the first innings. And then you know he wanted that, um, you know he wanted the the record because an injured Kyle Jamison came into bat at 10 ahead of him. So that ball could still be at 11. And then batted great, scored some runs, set the record. Um, his, he's, you know the best number 11 batsman of all time it's, it's it's great and not only is he that good and effective and consistently give it gives you like a cheeky 15 not out and a 30 odd run partnership which are just a, immensely crucial runs um in any like in any context for the final wicket of an innings he's also the most fun 
like you, you hear him on the stump mics just be call it, giving him just like it's, everyone else is like a yes no waiting he's sort of a like no not this time thank you very much maybe next time sort of like he just says the weirdest things and he's always smiling and he play he's got this awkward technique but then he just smashes the like leather off of the ball and he's just he's the most fun guy to watch bat um what what is your favorite quirk he, like just whether he's bowling whether he's uh batting whether he's in the field like we've seen a lot of bolty over the years what is your favorite trent bolt quirk that you've uh experienced i think it's the quips i think it's the stuff we just hear him saying stuff on the on the um thing. and he's he's good for a joke too because he's bowling to jimmy anderson at one point and jimmy anderson i think is third all time on the on the number 11 run scorer thing and they obviously both knew about it because he hit a boundary to go within six runs of him and bolt starts holding up his fingers for like six more runs and then anderson didn't score any more runs so that was all right but like he's this isn't the heat of battle you know and he's one of those dudes who can who can crack a joke and then also still be in the heat of battle like you know he's not slacking off because he's laughing around he's still gonna bowl it um He's still going to bowl something nice and tricky that that a um, batsman's going to have to deal with um, at full capacity. Then, like the very next ball, he's he's a joyful cricketer, and it, it's a it's a joy to watch and a joy to um, experience. It's it's nice to have a dude like that, especially when he's also taken excessive wickets. Um, very handy. Like he's 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 clearly having a lot of fun out there, but he's also having a lot of success out there, which is massive. Um, and Daryl Mitchell actually isn't far off on that, um, on the, on the fun capacity as well. Like you can tell he's a dude who em is embracing where his cricket career has gotten to. Like he's, he's not taking things for granted. He knows his game in and out. Um, he is going to be nice and aggressive, uh, nice and sort of like, you know, he wants to bat on the front foot. He's, if you drop a little bit short, though, he's going to rip you through leg side with that pull shot. Um, spinner comes on, he's going to look to get down the wicket and just lift him over his head for a massive six into some old lady's bear. Um, <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was a yarn. Um, and he's just like, oh, not to mention the slip catching as well, which is just excessively good. Like, he seems like the kind of player who um i don't know if this is maybe one of those things about like the slow cooking aspect where it's like it took him a while to get to this point and so now it's like um it, it, i don't know if it you could say it means more that might be unfair because but like it's unfair to anyone else but like he's he's like i said yeah he's not going to take it for granted kind of thing and he is just out there making the most of absolutely every opportunity that comes his way it's 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 ridiculous and pretty amazing and um yeah he's batted stunningly well in this series and i was thinking about this for like the batting order for the next test i'm like if he and nichols both Bolte play 11 Bolte 11 certainly that's the first name on the team sheet um but if he and henry nichols are both playing and kane williamson is back in at three like i would I, I would chuck Daryl Mitchell up to five and bet him ahead of Nichols. Um, Nichols might make way. We talked about this on the Variety Show. Like, if you have to squeeze someone out, if you want to keep... Well, Bracewell's now got COVID, so we don't know if he'll be um, recovered in time to play the third test or not, uh, or whether they'll... Will, will, will we even want a spinner in that? I don't know, but... Um, they're going from less from frontline spinner to part-time spinner. The next progression would be no spinner at all for the third test, so maybe that's how that goes. But I not just for Mitchell's form thing um, and Nichols coming back from injury and COVID himself, but also it breaks up the, the left-handers that you have there with, you know, you've already got Latham, um, Conway and Nichols in the top five, arguably. Um, slight Mitchell up to five, Nichols at six, but also Mitchell's form kind of makes him undeniable. It's like, just let him have an extra partnership out there to do his thing. Like he's, he's been the best batsman in the series for the Black Caps. It's not even particularly close. Um, and who would have picked that coming into the series, eh? You've like the idea of like whipping up a black caps team at this point just seems ridiculous. Yeah, like, I know. We have no idea who's, who's gonna, gonna get sick between now and yeah. then. Um Trent Bolt has scored more runs than Tom Latham, 51 runs. Tom Latham scored 45. So wow. shout out, shout out Trent Bolt. Um, and shout out Tom Latham when he's not captain. Um the Daryl Mitchell thing, you mentioned the slow cooking Black Caps contenders. I think 
the other aspect of that which is overlooked is that each one of those dudes takes their opportunity because you think mm. back daryl mitchell first test scores runs and then he gets an opportunity at the t20 world cup makes the most of that we saw we know glenn phillips scored runs on test debut kyle jamison enters test cricket dominates uh, michael bracewell in this test performed pretty well took his opportunity tom blundell scores a century yeah that west indies test maybe that was one of his first tests yeah i don't think it's debut but it was early on yeah um, like all these dudes are taking their opportunities and in a world where the black caps have all their players available that is what makes them so good and it, that's where the depth is really important but as to why those dudes like keep getting opportunities or why they're around why they're there now or why other dudes are not there it's because they don't take their opportunities like Rachin Ravindra, I believe, is going to be a Black Caps test opener. And I think that's the way we should view him. We shouldn't view him as an all-rounder. Uh, yep. We should just view him as a test opener who might be able to bowl spin if he wants to. He didn't take his opportunity. And all good. But he's a young dude. He'll get another opportunity and he'll come back better. He'll tap into the maturity and all that stuff, the knowledge of his game and who he is, which is what you explained with Daryl Mitchell. But he didn't take his opportunity, and that's why he's not there. Mitchell Santner did not take his opportunities. That's why he's not there. Like these, the, he had a lot of them too. <laughs> exactly. So, and it's hard to say it about AJ's Patel. It's really hard to say it about AJ's Patel. Um, but you can make a case that, like in New Zealand, he doesn't necessarily take his opportunities to command consistent selection as a first 11 player the dudes who get selected take their opportunities and it's really impressive how they do that it also tells you a bit about the selection process when you're trying to like read through it get some insights it's if you make your if you step in for a test you better score runs or take wickets because there's another dude waiting and we're not seeing that with the results right now but there are dudes taking their opportunities and those opportunities are coming in a variety of different ways. And it's up to you if you want to take it. Daryl Mitchell's definitely stamping his authority all over this Black Caps lineup and um, should be across most formats in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I mean, he already is. I, I would argue he's he opened the batting at the last 2020 world cup and he's got a odi century and the very very slim opportunities he's had to play odi cricket because we don't play much odi cricket anymore um despite being one of the very best odi teams on the planet so is he, is he new zealand's best batter right now like every all history aside just like straight up right now um well like gathering in the form aspect of it yeah probably i mean if you it depends how how close you want to look at it because outside of the series like Devin Conway has a very good case um Cam Williamson obviously hasn't played a lot of cricket so but that's not what we're talking about here we're talking we're talking more about form stuff um yeah probably probably is all format player who's should hopefully get some good opportunities on some of the limited over stuff I don't think he'll be there for all of it for that same reason of like their the test squad won't be there for all of it but he'll get it if, I'm sure he'll bash some runs off netherlands or scotland or whoever we play next like you know the black caps were almost the most frustrating thing about aotearoa sport well they were the most frustrating thing about aotearoa sport there for a hot second wild card and then the all whites ate all of that cake in a super niggly uh loss against costa rica one of those football games that for me, like as a casual football fan, I've seen it many times before, and it's easily one of the most annoying, frustrating things about football is just the like the scale of just referee madness. And then as soon as you're down, it's going to be super hard to get back into the game because you're dealing with opponents who are going to love that situation of just keeping you out of the game. And then... Uh, the last 20 minutes is like it's all hustle and bustle there's opportunities but it's also just like oh my god this doesn't feel like it's ever gonna come our way and then it doesn't yeah and then it just like all kind of turns to shit so how did you uh just work through that all whites game lost to costa rica world cup dream is over 
you shared some positive ideas just about the future of Aotearoa football on the blokes and, and the wahine side. Um, good things are coming. It just didn't come together against Costa Rica. And um, yeah, less, less like referee chat, the better, but take it as you, as you please. But the irony about the referee chat is I actually think the two VAR things were correct. Like, I thought there was a foul by Matt Garbett um, in the lead up to the goal. And I thought that was a red card for Costa Barbarousas. And it was a shocking challenge. Um, and it was exactly the kind of challenge that you see, like, he'd come on, he'd been on for eight minutes off the bench, he'd given the ball away about three times, he'd just given the ball away again. And it's one of those wonders, like, I've made, I've made these, like... <laughs> Um, mistake after mistake, I've got to do something desperate to make up for it. And you just go chucking yourself into a lunging tackle and then realize straight away, like, oh, fuck, what have I done? Um, that's, that's what that one felt like. Uh, and the garbage oh, one, yeah. Ima- like, imagine the, like, the mental battles. Like, you wait, what, 75 yeah. minutes to get on the field, and then your action on the field is just, like, terrible. Like, that's just like, yeah, anyone out there, like, pour some out, light one up for Costa Barbarossas and uh, his experience on the field in that game. Yeah, and I love Costa Barbarossas too. And like, he, he earned that, he earned the trust he was given to come on and that kind of, like, he's played 52 you know, caps for, for his country. Like, he's been a great servant for many years. And he was probably the guy who was the closest to being picked for the 2010 World Cup squad who didn't get picked, like the, the most unlucky guy not to be there. And so this was an opportunity for him, like at the back end of his career to cap that with an actual, with a nut, like a proper World Cup experience. And that's how it went. Like football's a cruel bastard sometimes, you know? Um, yeah. But I also wonder like, if Sapreet Singh had been fit, Sapreet so Singh starts instead of Matt Garbutt. Matt Garbutt might come off the bench in that role instead of um, Costa Barbarousas. If both Marco Rojas and Callum McCower hadn't been sick and back in the hotel and unavailable for this game, they might have come on in place of Costa Barbarousas. Like there's a little bit of that same parallel to what we're talking about with the Black Caps earlier on, where it's like, it's not that the depth is tested to the point where it's like half your team is missing. Like most of the guys are there. Um, or let alone Ryan Thomas as well. He hasn't been effective for a wee while for the All Whites, but um, most of that is down to just recurring persistent injuries, which I, I actually really worry about, um, like where his career goes from here with, with the amount of injuries that he's had. I think he's in a bit of a difficult place um, football-wise, but whereas Singh, it's just a matter of like, he'll recover from that injury and be fine. It's just, a, it's a niggly one that takes a long time to recover from. Um, and he probably aggravated it quite a lot by playing through it um, around this, like the start of the year and things like that. So um, that's just the, it's just the bag he finds himself in. That's, that's how it goes. But like the all whites in a similar way, it's like, imagine what they might've been able to like, to be able to unpick a team like that who are sitting very deep and giving you a lot of time in midfield, like that's just perfect Sapri Singh areas, not just for his passing range, but also for like, he can shoot from outside the area. He can curl one into the top corner if you stand off him too much, if you give him that room, which then draws the defenders out towards him and brings his passing game into the mix as well because a little bit more room to work with there and behind the defense and... Yeah, little frustrations like that where it's like just a few things had gone their way a little bit better than this could have been different. But even then, on the basis of the performance that they had against Costa Rica, they, they should have won. They created far more chances. Um, they were the better team throughout in terms of possession and whatever. And that is a there's two sides of that coin because on the one side, they weren't able to turn that into the goals they needed. And they made a stupid mistake early on, just started slow, conceded immediately right off the bat. A preventable goal too like it's just a little bit of um like if you look at the replay you see there's a throw in down the down our right hand side of defense joe bell and nico kerwin both go to mark the same guy which like kerwin probably should have dropped off and then toiloma doesn't have to come all the way out to the wing toiloma gets a challenge in on the first guy but they both fall over like they get tangled up and then a second attacker runs through takes the ball and now he's in space because there's no one there winston reed's drawn all the way out to the edge of the penalty area but he can't get out far enough to stop a cross coming in the cross goes in and there's like six all white bodies in the penalty area plus ollie sale and no one can stop 
Joel Campbell from getting a foot on the ball. But even then, Joel Campbell doesn't even strike it very well. He scuffs the shot. And because he scuffs the shot, it dribbles inside the far post. If you hit it sweetly, it's probably going to go in range to where Sale can save it. Like, there's just a lot of little, um, like, um, what do they call them? Like, swing and door moments or whatever the, the phrase is It literally is sounds like you're explaining the football equivalent of the Black Caps. Yeah. Like, it's, it's yeah. terrible. It's horrible. <laughs> it, it sucks. Just the little moments that don't go the right way. And then when you add them all up, um, Costa Rica are winning 1-0 and um, Johnny Besto smashing a way better than a runner ball 100. <laughs> Unfortunately, those can be the margins. And I think a lot of that, like Costa Rica started really well and then it allowed them to sit back and defend for the entire rest of the game. Like 88 more minutes, they could just be a defensive team. But they love that. That's what they want to do. Um, and so conceding so early just played into their hands. Um, and on the one hand, like that lets you, that that allows the, white, the all whites to have a, a lot of football, a lot of position because they're not pressing through the midfield or anything like that. But also, I don't know. I thought the midfield played well enough for the all whites that it was like, I think they could have done that anyway against the team that probably would have been a little bit more of a counter-attacking team to begin with. They didn't even have to counter-attack because they were already 1-0 up. But if it was nil all for a lot longer and they did have to commit a few guys forward now and then, I still think the all Whites would have had a majority of possession and I think they would have had more chances, like more effective chances created themselves because they would have been able to counter the counter-attack. They would have had a little bit more room to attack into. Chris Wood wouldn't have had three guys around him every single time the ball went near him kind of thing. Um so uh, that did really play into their hands. And I think that's probably a factor of experience versus inexperience with with these two teams where Costa Rica had quite an old team, a lot of guys in their 30s, so, you know, multiple hundred plus caps. We had three people in our squad who have more caps than their age, I think. Chris Wood, Bill Tuiloma and Winston Reed. And Winston Reed's only just got there. In fact, I'm not even I'm not even 100 percent sure on that because he's he might he might be there or thereabouts. Um, but I think I haven't got the thing in front of me, but I think it was about at six players or something in the starting lineup who have 10 or fewer caps, a bunch of guys like about four or five who are 23 or younger, like really young all whites team and not quite had that experience there before but this is where the other side of that coin comes in it's like on the one hand they got caught out and played into costa rica's hands conceded early allowed them to to play the game that they wanted to play on the other hand the all whites did dominate that game and i can't think of another occasion in which they've played a higher ranked opponent and the all whites have have bossed it to that extent like i cannot think of another example ever of that happening um they've had good positive results against other teams but like when you think about the way that the always played at the 2010 world cup a lot like what costa rica did in this game wasn't it like they're quite defensive built on the back like like the backbone of um of ryan nelson and and simon elliott and a uh, young winston reed and guys like this ivan Vislich, you know it wasn't necessarily a that they weren't a team that created like 15 shots in a match and had 60, 67% of position or anything like that against any of those teams. Um, even when they had a possibility to go through the next round in their last game against Paraguay, they were quite defensive, sort of happy with the draw, didn't really know how to how to play a more expansive game. That's, that's what that team had to do um, with the squad that they had and, and the scenario they found themselves in. There's nothing wrong with that and there's nothing wrong with how Costa Rica played or anything like that. I'm just saying that the all whites are a different beast now. Like that win or lose, and unfortunately it was a loss, but that feels like a turning point game for the all whites where it's like, well, they they played a team in a major, like huge ramification kind of game who most people thought would beat them. They did beat them, but the all whites were, you know, bloody unlucky in a, in a multitude of ways. And and perform to that level it just it feels like it, it feels like a sort of transitional moment like a a threshold kind of moment where it's like it's it's different now like the always have the confidence now on the back of that even though they lost they can come out of that with the confidence of being like well actually we can play good football against good teams that's not a that's no longer a problem that's not a thing we have to doubt ourselves for anymore like we 
we have the players, we have the ability, um, we have the the team spirit and culture and all these things. Um, so as far as the all-weights go moving forward, it's like it's a, it's a damn shame they don't get a, a World Cup. And there was just so many good storylines that would have been on display there and whatever, but it just it wasn't it wasn't to be. Um, we, we miss out on that one. But I, I see the trajectory heading in one direction and it's not downwards, you know what I mean? Like the, it, it feels like a, yeah, that, that a transition between the way that the all whites used to be perceived on the world stage and the way that they will be, well, per- perception is not the right word, actually. They're perceived by themselves um, and by the New Zealand public. Like who cares what the rest of the world think of us? Um, if they think we're going to come in and sit back defensively in, in games, that's probably to our benefit if we then go and, smoke him with a Chris Wood hat trick and a bunch of Sapri sing assists or whatever and Libby Kikache bombing up the wing and Joe Bell picking passes whenever. Um that's yeah, that's the all whites well, you know, I, the the way I wrote it in the um thing, uh, the the final word of the the reaction piece that I wrote is like this this isn't an ending for them. This is this is a beginning for them. Like you look at how young and inexperienced that team is and just think where they can go from here. That's extremely exciting, even though the short-term thing is pretty devastating that they could have made a World Cup and they didn't. The long-term vision is pretty bloody golden on the back of what we saw there. Silver lining, Qatar World Cup might not be the World Cup you want to go to. No. (laughs) No, I mean... There might be a better World Cup, the next World Cup or the World Cup after that. That's the real World Cup you want to go to just without your little uh, human rights violations. and Yeah, fewer kind of... dead slaves buried underneath <laughs> stadiums and stuff like that, yeah. Definitely. Let alone the fact that when it was voted for like a, you know, a dozen years ago or whatever, when they voted... <laughs> Uh, th- this astounds me every time I think about it. Like everybody on the FIFA Council who voted for Qatar to host the World Cup on the same day that they voted for Russia to host the World Cup before that. What do Russia and Qatar have in common, by the way? Like human rights abuses just like coming out of the ears. The same day they voted for both those two countries to host World Cups. Pretty much, uh, and it might, it might not, it might not even be pretty much. It might be absolutely everybody who was on that FIFA Council who voted for those decisions has been suspended or banned for corruption since every single one of them, basically like, how is that a valid, um, how is that a valid decision that they've just, everyone's just gone along with it. FIFA changed their leadership and everything like that. And they're like, we're, we're going to be so much more transparent and less corrupt and a much more likable organization. It's like, okay, well, are you going to undo the thing? Like the, the most obviously corrupt thing that happened in the last regime? No, we're just going to stick with that and, and continue to bury the slaves under the stadium when they, when that, they die of heat exhaustion and whatever. That sounds like more corruption than like Mexican state governments which is uh probably it's not it's territory there. not territory i mean you they might have in. been paying for some of it I um know. well you're saying you you mentioned like the international experience of the players and like how many tests they have played how many like international games of football yeah the thing that comes to my mind with some of the dudes behind you there is they're also at the start or closer to the start of their professional careers yeah so like if you're dealing with sure. the international squad of dudes who are 32 33 34 35 yes they have more international experience but they've also played 10 years of professional football and we've labeled it the golden generation and i think a lot of what you're saying about the all whites applies to the black caps and also the aotearoa kiwis let alone a wide variety of men's and women's sports in aotearoa where it's just booming like for those who don't know there is a lot like Aotearoa sport is thriving outside of rugby union and netball. And we're just like, all these ideas apply across the sports, but these like, yeah, we've got the best crop of young players we've ever had. And it looks really good that they're all playing. Like they're all in your flying Kiwis updates every week. They've all got good gigs around the world. They're mentioned in, um, you know, transfer, tickers and all that shit but they've also played two years of professional football three years of professional football maybe five years of professional football and once those dudes have settled into like really solid professional careers 
then it also bolsters the international team. So it's like you've got international experience, which Costa Rica had the advantage there. By nature of that, they've also got more professional football experience. And just like whatever that means, I'm not sure exactly what the specifics, you don't need to get into that um, as a brainstorm activity, but just the idea that some of these young players like Joe Bell, what's he going to be like when he's got seven years of professional football under his like belt like is the grind of just season after season after season i think that's a massive area of growth for the players as well as or playing into their international experience right yeah like joe bell um i don't remember how long he played with viking for in norway but i would probably i think it might have been a year and a half um and then he signed with bromby in, in denmark he's had half a season with them. Um, Libby Kikachi has had half a season with Empoli. Like they only just got those big transfers in January. Uh, Matt Garbett has had one year at Torino and he's, he's made the first team bench twice. Um, he hasn't yet played for the first team. He's been starring for their um, Primavera team. So he's, he's close. Like you, you could tell he's getting on the bench in his first season when he's only been playing youth football to that point. Like you can tell he's, he's pushing close. Um, but like that's the oh, Nando Pineker as well as a guy who's what 23 years old. He's um he's only really this season playing in Ireland, finally getting like regular senior football. He's been around a few different clubs and a few different loans. Um, but with Sligo Rovers, it's the first time he's actually getting like week in, week out professional football. It's real early days for dudes like that. Um and there's plenty more where that came from. Like I'm just looking at the starting lineup and you got um, like Ollie Sale, that was his fourth cap. Um, Winston Reed, uh, Winston Reed, 32 caps, age 33. So he's actually under his age still on the, on the cap thing. Um, Pineken nine, Bill Tuilama, 34, Joe Bell, 10, Chris Wood, 68, Alex Grieve, only his sixth cap. Again, only been a professional footballer since January. Um, Kikache, 10, Lewis, 21, Garbutt, 10, Nico Kerwin, eight. Like, it's actually jarringly inexperienced when you think about it, especially the complete opposite. I mean, Costa Rica have this generation of great players who've been around since 2014, um, and we saw a lot of them have very important um, performances for them in that game, uh, like Oscar Duarte and then Joel Campbell and um, Kayla Navas, of course, like, you know, one of the one of the top five goalkeepers of the last decade in the world, probably, Kayla Navas. He's, he's won absolutely... You talk about big game experience and, like, Kakache is one of the Libby Kakache has probably got some of the most big game experience in that all white squad on the back of having played against Juventus and AC Milan. Um, and that's not a lot. And those are mid season games. Kayla Navis has won multiple Champions League titles with Real Madrid. Now he plays for PSG. Like he's playing Champions League knockout ties every single year. Like that's incomparable. Like you, there's, there's no comparison between those two things. Um, and this, yeah, like the, there's other guys beyond that starting line. Marco Stamina, Saprit Singh wasn't there. Um, like the let alone guys who are pushing through who um, who haven't got to this international, like senior international level yet, but who will in, in due course. Like the, the talent, and this also applies to the football ferns and the women's side of things, but probably a little less so than with the All Whites. I think the All Whites, for whatever reason, have got... Um, the whatever reason the, the whatever reason might be as simple as just the wellington phoenix and ole academy have had longer to work with their women's um sides of their academies and their uh, with the men's sides of the academy and therefore have produced more players who are of that age and you, you won't see the results on the women's side for maybe five years but still the football ferns are bringing through plenty of good young players who are moving it like more professional players now than ever before on both sides of that um equation like the the trajectory is there we're building good structures somehow like development structures somehow whatever whatever's going on is working it's just like i don't know i had the feeling in that costa rica game maybe we were a year too early for this all white team like if you if they could have played this um if they could have played this uh playoff game in 12 months time where some of those costa rican guys like brian ruiz would be 37 or something like that maybe he's not playing anymore i mean i don't think anyone would retire a year out from a world cup um so how much that means to them but still they'd be a year older and 
that makes a difference. And our guys would be a year older as well. And that makes even more of a difference from our perspective with the just the extra experiences they would have been able to gain in that time. I it's another one of those what ifs. Like there's a fair few of those. What if some of those um other refereeing decisions, which again, not the not the VAR ones, which I think were actually spot on, but it's just some of the other ones that weren't consistently cool. I like I know Chris Wood like flailed his arms a little bit with that penalty shout. So he's obviously looking for it to some extent, but that just just because you fall a little bit more extravagantly doesn't mean you weren't pushed. It's just a weird one that I don't know how they didn't seem to think to look at that. I thought that was a dead set penalty, but I don't know. Others have said differently to me, so maybe um, maybe I'm different on that one. I don't know, but just a lot of those little moments. Um, but I don't know. The, tra- the trajectory is the same regardless. Like you can't always look at short term uh outcomes as a judge of long-term processes in fact you should never look at short-term outcomes as a judge of long-term processes that's like an Arsene Wenger thing eh? like win or lose on the weekend as long as we're on the right track kind of thing um because the wins and losses can be fickle and we saw that against Costa Rica it was it was kind of fickle the the better team the better performing team didn't win but that's because the the other team just was a little bit more clinical in a couple of areas. And a lot of that just does come down to experience. And with one more year of some of these guys playing professionally, I I think that would have been different, but that's also like, that can be a regret that it came at the wrong time, bad timing again, same as the, same as the black case, but it can also be, well, that year is going to happen. In a year's time, we're going to be at that stage that we're talking about where they're good enough to win an intercontinental playoff game. And there's going to be a couple more years before they come around to this thing again. They probably won't have to do another playoff game because of the the expanding World Cup for next time. But, you know, um, which, by the way, is co, uh, co-hosted between USA, Canada and Mexico. So you're talking about some of the Mexican state government things and um, comparing it to, to FIFA corruption with uh, hosting things. So you never know. Um, not suggesting anything, but FIFA has a track record. Um, we just might need a decent security uh, setup to play your games. Oh, you qualify in a group that's in Canada, or <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how. That's the luck of the draw, though. Who cares? Um, the thing with FIFA World Cups is that once the it's same as the Olympics. Once the thing actually happens, it's like you're not even in that country anymore. You're in a separate, um, you know, standalone country called FIFA or the IOC or whatever. Like they just they take over a small. It's like. It's like a peaceful takeover, you know. Um, they just take over this area, and it's like this is our country now. We run this thing um, for for about a month, and then everyone packs up and leaves. Um, and back to what you had before. But that time will come with the all whites. Like over the next four years, over the next cycle, these guys are going to develop into those players that we're talking about, um, and they're already pretty bloody good to start with. So, and there's going to be more coming through um, behind this lot. And Winston Reid, I doubt just because every time I see him play, it seems like he picks up a new injury or an existing one that I just, I can't really see him still being around in four years just because of that. But there's absolutely nothing to say that Chris, like I, I can think of no evidence to say that Chris Wood won't be around in four years time. I think Chris Wood might be around in eight years time. Like maybe I'm projecting a bit too much. Like I did with Ross Taylor once upon a time, like yeah, Taylor will play the next world cup after this one. Well, we know now he didn't. He only made it through half that cycle, but that's fair enough. Um, personal decision at, at any juncture. But with Chris Wood, like, I mean, well, hey, with Ross Taylor, one of the things with him was the runs were starting to dry up and we could see that. And that probably makes things a little less fun when um, when that's the case. But with Chris Wood, like, his game isn't built on athleticism or speed or things like that, which are going to falter with age. Built on strength and structure and, like, good decision making and um and a, a decent first touch and good finishing abilities they're going to be just as good when he's 34 as when he's 30 they're probably going to be still pretty good when he's 38 like barring a serious injury or anything like that i Zlatan Ibrahimovic is like 43 now and he's still negotiating for new thing obviously chris wood isn't the physical specimen that Zlatan is but um he could easily be playing at a world cup when he's 38 and still be doing a, you know, a good job of what he does because his game translates to, to being an older player. Um, there's no, there's no loss there. And 
pick up a couple extra defenders to to cover what Winston Reed did, who, you know, Winston Reed can just move into a coaching role or something like that, and he's still going to be extremely valuable. Um, this team isn't getting worse. Like, they're not really losing anyone um, over the next cycle, other than potentially Reed and maybe a few of those, like, Tommy Smith, Barbarossa's type guys who you've got guys coming through to replace. Um, they're not first 11 players anymore. So the future is still bright. I, that, that doesn't change at all. And in fact, I'm, I'm more positive about the All-Whites now after seeing them lose that game just because of how well they played in that sort of, um, yeah, that transitional thing of what I was saying about like that they now have the confidence and the experience of, a, of an occasion like this. That is only going to do them well, even though they lost. You mentioned like the absence of Sapri Singh, some of the other players that weren't there. So, like, if I'm the question I'm about to ask, like, an easy answer is Sapri Singh. Like, yes, Sapri Singh can step into the All Whites, but uh, who else? Like, who are some of the young guns that you've been tracking who could step into the All Whites for this next cycle, this next phase? And given what I was saying about the professional experience, these dudes are, you know, they might be 18, 19, 20, and they're playing professional football somewhere around the world, whether that's in Aotearoa or, you know, on your flying Kiwis beat. Who are some of the, like, the new younger players that you think are going to contribute to the All Whites in this next phase? Maybe they're not in professional football right now, but they're going to be soon and they're going to gather that experience or they are or they have started their professional journeys and they are building up that mana to step into the all whites and at the very least compete for some of those spots that you just highlighted, um, given some of the veterans will move on. Yeah, it's a little bit, I mean, like Alex Grieve came out of nowhere to, to be in the all whites squad. He didn't come out of nowhere and like, he was one of the best domestic players in the, in, um, in the country for a couple of years before, um, before he got a St. Mirren deal, but it was like, that doesn't get you into the all whites. You, the professional um, performances is what got him into the all whites. And then all of a sudden he's starting this game. Like it's hard to predict necessarily the, the growth trajectory of some of these dudes, but I mean, the Phoenix definitely have a couple of very, like, Ben Old is his cap. He's, um, he got a game early on in the Oceania stuff. Alex Paulson and Sam Sutton certainly wouldn't be too far away. Um, I, well, who, I'm trying to think who the Ole Academy have in the next way. They're a little bit more spread out at the moment. They sort of had a bunch of players leave at once. It's a little bit harder to, to predict. But um, I don't know, guys like Case Sims and Otto Ingham are, are playing professionally in the lower things. Robbie Sabo as well with them um, in, in a, a couple of divisions down in Sweden who are good players who could go on to do good things. I think, I think the main thing is like, I don't really see any, why. Like, well, if anyone comes out of the blue and doesn't Alex Grieve um, and surges into like starting 11 capacity, that's incredible. And they, that's a massive bonus. I think the biggest thing for them is just, the improvements of the guys they've already got and then the next wave sort of come and start at the bottom and work their way up like that um i don't necessarily anyone see anyone coming and being key players um very quickly over the next couple of years because to do that you'd have to you'd have to dislodge key players who themselves are only 22 23 right now and themselves are only going to get better and are already playing at high professional standards and therefore good things will happen um yeah, I, I did have that tinge of regret, though, about, like, Sapri Singh, Marco Rojas, Ryan Thomas, um, and Callum McCowett, all unavailable for this game. It's like, we lost 1-0 trying to find a goal, and there's four incisive attacking players right there who were unavailable. So it's another one of those, um, another one of those little things where the timing just didn't quite work out. But um, it's like the, the black beauty caps, of it. The Black Caps need a wicket on a final yeah. day on a final session and you know some of their strike bowlers aren't available and you're like oh yeah. well Carl Jamison's got a sore back and might miss the next test as well yeah that's yeah pretty much exactly that which which is actually what happened and it's what happened to the all whites as well it's it's uh it's frustrating but even on the basis of that performance they could have won um they didn't but they could have which is yeah a, a rare thing for the all whites to see them playing as as 
like sort of positively and successfully as that, even in a losing performance, it's still a, like, it's still something to see. It's a sight to behold. It's, um, it's completely different from what we've seen from them in the past in those kind of games. Well, like I'll save the big Aotearoa Kiwis, Kiwi Ferns, uh, Tonga, Samoa, all that rugby league stuff for probably next week's niche cast to preview some of those games. But the, the final thought that I'm having here is just doubling down on how much Aotearoa sport has changed because it wasn't long mm. ago where dudes were playing for the All Whites just because they played football. You know, and it's looking at this Aotearoa Kiwis squad, Sean Johnson isn't in the halves. He's not in the squad because there are better players. And it's like, yeah. you're just because you're playing in the NRL doesn't mean you're going to be selected for the Aotearoa Kiwis. No, you need to be playing well and commanding selection. And it's harder for the Black Caps just with how like their depth is being tested due to outside you know, factors. But it's the same idea where it's like, oh, you hit a 50 in the Plunkett Shield. You should be playing for New Zealand. No, that's not the case. Like, even if you're like, some of those seamers who rolled out for the Black Caps, you know, between 2000 and 2014, they would have, yeah, you're taking wickets in the Plunkett Shield, but do you have anything that can be translated to test cricket? Whereas now you need to have international cricket qualities to just be in the mix. You can't just well, be well, like... that era you're talking about, Will Williams would have played 50 ODIs and 15 tests yeah. in, in that era, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of same ideas for a lot of the other sports and um, the Kiwi Ferns squad. You need to be playing NRLW. And if you're not, like there's a young lady, let me just double check this name, Lyshawn Albert Jones. She doesn't play NRLW, but she was the MVP of the, the last women's competition, the NZRL women's competition. So you need to be playing well in that grade. You need the best player, maybe. Or you need to be playing NRLW, like the benchmark for earning selection in these teams, football ferns, same idea. All those players are professional players. And now it's not just a case of, are you a professional player? Cool, you're coming into the team. No, you need to be a professional player playing better than all the other professional players we've got at our disposal. And these ideas have gone across every sport, basketball. You can't just make the tall blacks because you play basketball and you're decent. No, like you got to be like dominating your professional league and be a factor to earn selection. And it's just that shift has happened in Aotearoa sport where the depth is so much more intense now, um, just with so much quality coming through. And it comes back to this idea about the youngsters. We keep hearing how... Uh, youngsters don't want to play sport and how youngsters are moving away from sport and all this shit where all these sports we're covering the best the youngsters are a whole different breed like they're the most talented we've ever seen and they're also like really good kids they're mature they work hard their sole focus is being the best person they can be from like a person maturity standpoint and the best athlete and all of that's compiling just to raise up all these other sports so it is a bit of a bummer podcast that we're reflecting on some, you know, black caps losing to England twice, all whites stumbling at this final hurdle. But ultimately, all these teams are in extremely strong positions compared to where, like, even when we started the niche case, like, let alone our childhood, when it was Rando Central and these international teams, like, Aotearoa Kiwis could have, like, randoms playing in the halves. Now you need to be one of the best players in the NRL to crack that halves role. And it just tells the story of Aotearoa sport. Yeah, I think when a lot of people say that kids aren't playing sport anymore, um, when they say sport, they just mean rugby and or rugby and netball. Um, and actually, actually, that's not the be all and end all. And perhaps that's part of the same conversation that we're talking about as well as this sort of like spreading of the wings in terms of embracing a whole bunch of different sports. Uh, one of the things I'm working on at the moment, which takes time, um, but the, the quotable Stephen Adams for the, 
for the season that was. And I found where he was, it was the Chris Vernon interview he did on media day way back when with Grand City Media. Um, it was really good chat. Like I could have, I could have listed even more quotes than I did from that, but one that I ended up cutting um, from it, I, cause it didn't serve as much of a purpose, but they were asking him about playing, like, why are you so tough? Is it because you played rugby growing up? And he's like, well, I played rugby growing up, but I sucked at it because I was too tall. And back then I was relatively skinny. And as you got just, you get levered by guys who are um, six foot and like a hundred kgs at age 15, you, you don't last very long if you're, um, you know, six foot eight, probably at that age or whatever, like six um, foot eight and a hundred kgs. Yeah. It's, there's a difference. Um, a big difference. And he's got further to fall than most people as well when he gets tackled. So, you know, but he said one, one thing that was quite interesting is he said in America, like his, his view of this, I, I can't speak to it. I'm just going on what Stephen Adams's perception of it is, is that in America, kids are quite often specialists from a young age. And he's like, in New Zealand, everyone just plays as many sports as they can. Like you, you might be like, if you're a talented sportsman, you might be playing like five different sports for your school or something like that. Um, and in America, you're kind of pushed into specializing as I am a basketball player. I am a gridiron player sort of thing at quite a young comparative age. And I hear a lot of people like Susie Bates talks about this a lot, because obviously she's an absolute gun basketballer. And I'm imagining probably quite a few other sports. She'd be very good at one of those. Um, whatever you try your hand at, you're going to be amazing at like how much that helps. Um, and I think that's probably also part of this thing of what we're talking about, like newer generations be producing more depth more quality it's like also across more sports it's like you don't pigeon yourself pigeonhole yourself into one or two sports suddenly you actually do get to be also a probably comes back around to that better person and better um you know on and off the field as well and more mature and things like that you just get a better scope and perspective and context and everything so i think it's probably all part of the same conversation really and that was our conversation, the niche cast corridor. We'll be back with uh, email bangers coming out tomorrow afternoon, big yarns. So if you do want to read about that Aotearoa Kiwi squad that is live, the full breakdown on the website, as well as all the other content. And then podcast cycle starts again next week. So pick it up to yourself. Enjoy Aotearoa. Enjoy the vibe. The winter season is here. Bit of winter solstice. I wonder... The winter solstice Matariki situation seems uh, intriguing that, now yeah. that I think about it. Um, yeah, big it up to yourself. Māori order, raise your mana, chicha. Stay beautiful too. <laughs>